Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. The word awesome means extremely impressive or daunting, inspiring great admiration, apprehension, or fear. That's what awesome means. Today we're going to be talking about evolution, but we're not going to be talking about it scientifically as we have in the past. Today we're going to be talking about it biblically because there are a great many people, I think, who believe that you can actually believe in evolution and just add it to the Bible and you'll still be okay. So today we're going to talk about starting the screen sharing. Today we're going to talk about top 10 proofs that theistic evolution is not biblical. Next page. This is what evolution, the th general theory of evolution is. That the universe and this earth, this earth specifically is about four to five billion years old. And that at that time, well, it's 14 trillion years, billion, uh, 14 billion years ago, your universe, but uh, about four, 4 billion years ago that life began, shows here prokaryotes, cells without nuclei, right here about 4 billion years ago. And it progresses up through eukaryotes, bacteria, protozoa, sponges, corals. Then you get animals like fish and vertebrates and insects, dinosaurs, reptiles, birds, mammals, flowers, and bees, and then approximately 0.01 billion years ago, you have primates and human beings evolved from those step by step. Next page. Theistic evolution is the idea that God used the process of evolution for creation, that God guided the process of evolution through his intelligence. Theistic evolution believes the earth really is billions of years old. It believes that the days of creation are not literal 24 hour or so days, but that rather they are eons of time. It believes that life began in the oceans and branched out as in the previous page, just like current secular scientific theory. It may even go so far as to say that Adam and Eve were not real historical figures, but that Genesis is pure allegory or something similar. So my goal here today is to demonstrate that this view is 100% against scripture. In other parts of this series, we have dealt with science previously to refute evolution itself. And if you care to, you can go back on the CWAC Ministries group and review those. But let's for now go to proof number one for why theistic evolution is not biblical. It would mean that there was, and that the first proof is that there was no physical death before sin. Now, the Bible is very clear on this point. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Next page. In the theistic evolution view, the top, the top line, it shows that millions of years of death and destruction led to the present. Whereas in the Bible, it, it teaches that man's sin, bottom row, man's sin led to physical death and spiritual death as regards to man. But we're talking just about the world here in the universe, the, the, the world that is. Physical death was caused by man's sin. Next page. Couple of boxes. Bible, Bible scriptures here, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Revelation 21, 1 to 4, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So the Bible teaches that there was no physical death of animals or man before Adam's sin. And that's the first proof that theistic evolution is completely unbiblical. Next page. 
proof number two is that animals and people were originally vegetarian. Genesis chapter one, verse 29 through 30. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God made it clear at the beginning that animal flesh was not part of the food chain. All living creatures were to only eat plants, never eat other animals. Now, there's some discussion in creation science circles as to whether or not that means insects. There's some thought that says that insects don't have breath of life like uh, mammals and other animals do. Um, I'm not sure what all that means or what all that's true, but I'm just looking at what the Bible says clearly that God, that at the beginning, animal flesh was not part of the food chain. Human beings, um, dinosaurs, bears, lions, everything only ate plants, they never were to eat other animals. Let's look at the next page. Genesis 9, verses 1 to 3. This is after the flood. Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and on all the birds in the sky and on every creature that moves along the ground and on all the fish in the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you, that is human beings, the green plants, I now give you everything. And I put human beings in there, that's my parenthesis. It, it may be that this means other animals too, which it probably should. That was probably a mistake on my part to add the human beings in there. He's speaking to human beings here, but it's probably true for the animals too that now the animals were free to eat each other as we see the shark doing to that poor little seal there. But uh, if theistic evolution is true, then animals have been eating each other for millions of years. And so the Bible would not be correct in what it says that uh, animals and, and human beings were originally vegetarian until after Noah's flood. And we remember from my previous studies that that has been about 4,500 years ago from today. Next page. Proof number three, we're building on these facts here. First, uh, death would have come before sin. Second, the animals would have been eating meat instead of Bible being saying they were vegetarian. And proof number three would be that death and bloodshed would be good to God. Let's read some more scriptures. Genesis chapter one, verse 20 through 25. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with water with which the water teems and that moves in it according to their kinds and every living, every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. We see that phrase for a second time. Next page. God saw that it was good. But if theistic evolution is true, animals and people would have been dying, rotting, stinking up the joint, suffering pain and sorrow, and God saw that it was good? Once again, we have Genesis 131 at the end of creation. It says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Again, if theistic evolution is true, these verses cover a span of millions of years of animals eating each other as part of the food chain, carnage, pain, and suffering. So does it really make sense what God said, that it was all very good? Next page. The prophet Isaiah 
gives us a picture of a sinless earth or heaven in Isaiah chapter 11, six through nine. The wolf will lie down, with, will live with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Also in Isaiah 65, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is what very good means. So when God looked at the world and saw that it was very good, I think that he looked at it and did not see death and bloodshed. Next part is the quote from Barnes Notes on the Bible. It says, by nature, the wolf preys upon the lamb and the leopard upon the kid and the adder is venomous and the bear and the cow and the lion and the ox cannot live together. But if a state of things should arise where all this hostility would cease, where the wild animals would lay aside their ferocity and where the feeble and the gentle would be safe, where the adder would cease to be venomous and where all would be so mild and harmless that a little child would be safe and could lead even the most ferocious animals, that state would represent the reign of the Messiah. I think this is what Eden was like. And I think it's what heaven is going to be like. God is going to return the earth to the glory that it had before Adam sinned. Let's go on. Proof number four that theistic evolution is unbiblical is in the account of the creation of Adam and Eve. If you hold to the theistic evolution in the most common form in which it would, is held today, you would have to say that Adam and Eve were not the first human beings. Perhaps Adam and Eve never even existed. You'd have to say God didn't act directly or specially to create Adam out of the dust of the ground. You'd have to say that Adam and Eve were born from part human, part monkey, or hominid parents. You'd have to say that God didn't act directly to create Eve from a rib or part of Adam's side. You'd have to believe that Adam and Eve were never sinless human beings. And you'd have to believe that not all human beings have descended from Adam and Eve, for there were thousands of other human beings on earth at the time God chose two of them and called them Adam and Eve. That's assuming you think Adam and Eve actually existed. Next page. But here's what the Bible says. Genesis chapter two, verse seven, and verse 21 through 22. Then God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. It doesn't seem to me that both the evolution story and the biblical story can be true. So if I have to pick one, I choose to take God at his word. Next page. Look again at the creation of Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. If theistic evolution is true, Adam, if he even existed, would have, become, would have begun life as an embryo, then a fetus, then he would have been born alive as all human beings have been. He would have been an infant to then grow it up, grow it up, <laughs> then grew up, went through adolescence, became an adult, etc. Would he not have been alive before God breathed into his nostrils? Of course he would have been. Before nostrils formed on his embryonic face, was Adam alive? Sure, he would have been. But isn't it just simpler to take God at his word? Next page. Let's look again at the creation of Eve. Genesis 2, 21 through 22. So the Lord caused, the, God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. 
Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So if theistic evolution is true, Eve, if she even existed, would have begun life inside her part human hominid mother as an embryo, then a fetus, and would have been born naturally as all human beings have been. How can this possibly be reconciled with what the Bible says, with what God says? It can't. I don't see any way that it can. So this is the second, the fourth reason that uh, theistic evolution is not biblical. Next page. Theistic evolution says that Eve could not have come from Adam's side. But look at 1 Corinthians 1.8. This is written by Paul. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. The Bible teaches that the first woman came directly from a man's side. But if theistic evolution is correct, the first woman would have come from the body of a woman, a female. So was Paul right or was Paul wrong? Did Paul not understand science? Is that all there was to it? Did he just not understand science or did he just understand God? Remember, the Holy Spirit revealed this truth to Paul. And I keep saying it. Isn't it simpler to take God at his word? He was there. I think he knows what, it's ta what he's talking about. One more side note, Genesis 2, 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. Not only are we told that Adam came fully grown from the dust of the ground, and not only are we told that Eve came fully grown from the man's side, but we are told all the animals and birds came from the dust of the ground. Theistic evolution, though, says life began in the oceans billions of years ago, etc., so why would God actually create life in the oceans and then tell Moses he created it out of the dust of the ground? Isn't it simpler to take God at his word? We'll continue with this in, in a couple of, couple of pieces here. Next one. Proof number five that theistic evolution is not biblical is what Jesus Christ himself said. Look at this graphic on the right side here. I know the print is very small depending on what kind of device you're watching this on. But theistic evolution tries to smash all 4.46 billion supposed years of Earth history into the biblical six days of creation week. This graphic to the right is a representation of that Earth history as if it were crammed into one day. You can see the beginning there of the, around a couple of minutes after, a couple of second, minutes in, it says 300, a couple of seconds in actually, it says 30 million years ago, earth and planet fell a collide, debris from the collision results in the moon. And then it goes on through um, the late, late heavy bombardment from the sky. Then you have around eight o'clock, you have uh, the last common universal ancestor, which they call Luca, cute. But that's when they think the first common ancestor of life began and it goes on. As you can see all the way up through almost hitting up to 24, at 2359.12, it says, genus homo appears. And then at 2359.56, hours, modern humans appear. So remember that timeline. Next page. Mark 10, verse 6, is the ver words of Jesus Christ himself. He said, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. If the days of creation week were normal days, 24 hours long, about 6,000 years ago, this statement from Jesus makes sense. But if they were long eons of time, as in the graphic on the previous page, why would Jesus say what he said? Next one. Theistic evolutionists would argue that God created the universe 14 billion years ago. And so if Adam and Eve evolved, if they existed, about 30,000 years ago. That would be near the end of creation. Isn't that right? So only after 99.998% of creation did Adam and Eve come along. Really? That's like looking at this clock while you're at work and saying, this is the beginning of my workday. And as you can see there, it says 459.30. I don't think that's the beginning of the day. Mark 10, verse 6, again, but at the beginning of, of creation, God made them male and female. Isn't it simpler to take God at his word? He created human beings at the beginning of creation. 
not so near the end. Next one. Proof number six of uh, the reason that theistic evolution is, un is unbiblical. It says vegetation surviving without the sun. Genesis chapter 1, 11 through 13. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. And so the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. But according to theistic evolution, day three would have to last for millions of years. That's assuming that that's what they say. That's, there's something called the day-age theory, and then some people just don't even believe in the days at all. But let's go on to the next page. Then... Genesis 1, 14 through 18, and God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Next page. How did all the plants and trees and grass and all the other vegetation survive for millions of years without the sun? Again, this is assuming that you think that God did his act of creation, creating the sun the way that he said. Well, of course they didn't have to. The Bible clearly says there was a light source, apparently temporary in nature, Genesis 1-3, that there were still periods of alternating light and darkness, verses one, verses four through five of Genesis one, and that there were evenings and mornings for those first three normal days. Chapter one, verse five, eight, and 13. Now theistic evolutionists would say that God only made the sun visible from the earth. But I think that basically calls God a liar because the word that he uses there in the original language Hebrew is the same as made or created it doesn't say made visible there were hebrew words for that and we'll continue with this point but vegetation surviving without the sun from day three to day four is another proof that theistic evolution is not biblical next page this is the most important one to me i think um, for a couple reasons but i'll go, go through it it says why wouldn't god just tell moses the truth Think about how simple this would be to tell Moses that he used evolution for all of creation. He could have just told him, this is how I did it. But you say Moses wouldn't have understood it with all the complexity of biological structures, DNA increases in genetic information through mutations that are always part of evolutionary transitions. Um, after all, the Bible was never intended to be a science book, they say. Well, Imagine the Genesis account of the creation of the sun went like this. And God said, I made a yellow dwarf star containing hot gases of hydrogen, helium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, and iron, which burns at temperatures of 5,800 degrees at the surface to 10 million degrees at the core, with a diameter of 900,000 miles suspended 93 miles from, million miles from the surface of the Earth in one of the arms of the Milky Way galaxy. <gasps> Isn't it easier to say, I made a great light in the expanse of the sky? That's what he said. He could have said all that big, you know, scientific stuff, but he didn't need to. But again, would Moses have understood it? Let's look at the next page. God could have simplified the explanation of all of creation to Moses just the same. Imagine Genesis 1 read like this. I created life in the oceans a long time ago and too small to see over long periods of time they grew larger and more complex until eventually they became all the plants and animals you see now some of those animals became mankind and it was good Moses would have understood that he wouldn't have been offended by it it would have been a simple truthful explanation but that's not what God told Moses so why did God use the words he did if it wasn't true? 
if you're a theistic evolutionist, you would have, you'd probably have to believe that God did write the Bible. If you claim to be a Christian, you believe that God wrote the Bible, right? So if God wrote the Bible through Moses, why did he use the words he used if that wasn't how he did it? He could have used other words. Let's go on. If you have the power to speak something into existence, why not do it? If you have a power to make man out of the dust of the ground, why not just do it? Why go through this long, drawn-out process of evolution when it isn't necessary? I don't know why. Look, the, this, is, this is getting into proof number eight, actually. I didn't realize from the top. Uh, proof number eight, why is the creator God bound by physics and time? Next page. When Jesus Christ multiplied the bread and the fish to feed thousands of people, how did he do that? He did it instantly. He didn't just create the flour from nothing and the salt from nothing and the water from nothing and then go through the process of kneading it and baking it and putting it and making it into bread. No, he spoke it into existence. He said, There's, here's bread and everybody takes some, just like that. It was a miracle and the creation of the world and human beings, etc., was a miracle. Let's go to proof number eight, uh, ne or next page. This is kind of a side issue, but it says, God said, let us make man in our image. So what part of the evolutionary process is the image of God? Is primordial goo the image of God? Are amino acids the image of God? Are amoebas the image of God? Are trilobites, lizards, monkeys the image of God? I don't think so. And I don't think God's a cosmic gambler either. So said Einstein. But why is God, the creator God bound by physics and time? I don't think he is. I think he could do in a very brief moment what it would take natural processes billions of years, if ever, to do. Let's go to the next one, proof number nine. It waters down the authority of scripture. Now, I've touched on this a little bit. All the way through here, we're touching on this. But specifically, you may think, what's the big deal? If I believe God used evolution, so what? It's not important. Well, I think it is important. Here's why. The biggest problem we are facing today is the watering down of scriptural authority. People don't want to believe that what the Bible actually says about anything. Does this sound familiar? It's what Satan used in the Bible to tempt Eve. Did God really say? Did God really say? Let's look at a couple of examples. Next page. Did God really say that X behavior is, is sinful or wrong? Did God really say that there's only one way to heaven? Did God really say that X belief is false? Did God really say there is a hell? How many times have you tried to talk to God to people about God in the Bible? And the other person says, well, that's not the God I believe in. Or my God would never pick your thing. I have. Let's look at the next page. This comes from the 2020 State of American Theology Study. 40% of Americans, just 40%, believe that only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. That's not a majority, folks. Most people believe that you can go to heaven without trusting in Christ alone. 51% of Americans believe Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 54% of Americans believe religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. 59% of Americans believe the Holy Spirit is just a force, not a personal being. And 64% of Americans believe that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Then it had some other bad, tough statistics about people 18 to 34, the young people in our society. 50% of Americans 18 to 34 believe the Bible contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. 54% of Americans 18 to 34 believe that the Bible is not 100% accurate in all that it teaches. 
44% of Americans 18 to 34 believe that modern science disproves the Bible. 28% of Americans 18 to 34 believe the Holy Spirit can tell me to do something which is forbidden in the Bible. And only 29% of Americans 18 to 34 believe that even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. The scriptures are being undermined greatly in our culture and in our world. Other people of you who live in other countries may find worse statistics even than this for the people in your culture. But believing in theistic evolution waters down the authority of scripture. If you don't believe what Jesus said about creation and what Moses said about creation, how can you believe in Jesus himself? Next one. People don't want to believe that certain things are sins anymore. People don't want to believe that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven anymore. They don't want to believe there's a hell. They don't want to believe that they need a savior. They want to believe that Jesus was nothing more than a nice guy who walked around a couple thousand years ago, sat among the daisies, had little children sit in his lap, said warm and fuzzy things, was really nice and just wants fans. They think Jesus was a righteous dude. But when you talk about sin, and repentance and redemption, when you talk about Jesus' blood and his sacrifice, they say, oh, well, that's too negative for me, or that's not the Jesus I believe in. I submit to you, this is connected to theistic evolution. Folks buy into the idea that, the, that evolution is scientifically true, so they assume the Bible is being interpreted incorrectly on that account. So they twist the scripture to make it appear that what they think science has taught them is true. You can go back to the previous um, talks that I've given on this subject to learn why evolution is scientifically impossible, why Earth has to be only a few thousand years old. And you can see where actual evidence undermines what evolution has to say and proves what the Bible says. But when people distrust the Bible in one area, it's easy for them to distrust the Bible in every area. And I always want to say, well, at what point do you kick in? At what point do you start trusting the Bible? Is the floating axe head true when Elijah uh, caused the axe head to float, the iron axe head? Is that true or is that allegory too? Maybe Jesus never rose from the dead. Maybe he wasn't God. And it goes on from there. Let's go on to the last one. Proof number 10 why theistic evolution is un unbiblical is the Bible's description of a day the days of creation are not long periods of time when you take them at face value you can see the graphic on the side there day one light and dark day two clouds and water day three land and plants day four planets and stars day five fish and birds day six man and land animals each day in genesis one has an evening and morning formula they have a number after them, the first day, the second day, third day, etc. And they use a Hebrew word, yam. Now, when combined with a number, the Hebrew word yam always means an ordinary day. There's no other way to interpret that in scripture. That's what Moses meant to say. And I'm going to prove that next page. If the days were long periods of time, there were other possible words that God could have used. Yomim, which means days of evening and morning. He could have used Kadem, which means from days of old. He could have used Olam, which also means from days of old. He could have used Dor, which means generations of days. He could have used Tamid, which means a continuation of days. He could have used Shana, which means a year. And he could have used Yom Rab, which means a long year. But in Exodus 29, 9 through 11, he says... Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Why? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. God worked six days and rested for one to set a pattern for us that we should work six days and rest for one. I don't see any other way to interpret that other than God used the, day, the kinds of days that he used. Next page. There was a man named Dr. John Howitt. He works for Answers in Genesis, which is Ken Ham's organization. He wrote to appropriate professors in nine leading universities asking, 
Do you consider that the Hebrew word yam as used in Genesis 1 accompanied by a numeral should be properly translated as A, a day commonly understood, B, an age of time, or C, either without preference? Two colleges did not apply, Oxford and Cambridge, but the professors at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Toronto, London, McGill, and Manitoba replied unanimously that it should be translated as a day as commonly understood. Professor Robert H. Pfeiffer of Harvard added of 24 hours to his reply. Oxford University Hebrew professor James Barr stated that he knew of no other professor of Hebrew at any world-class university who would say otherwise. So God said what he said, and I believe what he said. For more information on this, you can also look at the top 10 proofs for a young earth. And there's another one out there that's called top 10 proofs evolution is scientifically impossible. Look back at our other CWAC Bible study ministries for that. The bottom line for me is that Jesus Christ is God. He knew how long creation took. He wasn't confused about the world he made. And I trust what he said about creation which means I also trust what he said about man's sin. I trust what he said about salvation. And so I believe in the gospel.